questions. Are there any questions? I call the Leader of the Opposition oh, on indulgence. I rise to associate the Opposition with the remarks of the Prime Minister. Our thoughts today are with all the families and friends of the passengers and crew of Malaysian Airways Flight MH370. The pain of not knowing what's happened to one's family has now given way to the agony of loss. We too offer our sympathies to all of those whose worst fears have been realised. These matters are never easy to deal with, but to have to wear a very public loss when perhaps you would seek to mourn in peace and privacy has also been very difficult. The disappearance of MH370 is a mystery that's captured global attention. Unlike perhaps some disasters which occur around the world, because all of the citizens of the world fly, this disaster is one which touches all of us. Australia can be rightly proud of the leading effort that it's played in the international search effort. Our servicemen and women have taken on an extremely difficult task with determination and dedication. This search has brought nations together. Australia is proud of the Australian contribution, and I believe the world is grateful to them. Madam Speaker, we may never know the full story of MH370, but we do know that there will be families consumed by grief today and the years to come, and our hearts go out to them. We move to questions. Are there any questions? I call the member for Isaac. The My question Isaac. is to the Prime Minister. Today the Attorney General has announced that the Abbott government wants to give a green light to bigotry in Australia. Is it the intention of the government to allow a person to be racially insulted and offended at a community event and have no recourse? I call the uh, Leader of the House. Madam Speaker, I regard that as a personally offensive question, and I'm sure all on this side of the House do. The idea that anyone on this side of the House would condone bigotry is a disgraceful slur, and I would demand that the member uh, withdraw the assertion and reword the question to be more appropriate in the Parliament of Australia. The manager of opposition business. We'll have some silence in the House. Thank you. Madam Speaker, it would be better if we were able to accept what the Leader of the House has just put to the Parliament. But what was said in the Senate yesterday and endorsed here by the Prime Minister this is yesterday— This now going to argument. No, Madam Speaker. A yes, Manager of Opposition Business, it is going to argument. You'll resume your seat. The nature of the question did have an offensive nature about it, but I'll let it stand. I call the Honourable the Prime Minister. Well, Madam Speaker, uh, I, uh, I accept that this is a difficult issue. I accept that it's an issue which arouses strong passions in our community on both sides, and I think it should be treated uh, with seriousness and with balance in this parliament. What the government is attempting to do, uh, as carefully, as collegially, as consul consultatively as we can, is to get the balance right. To get the balance the member right. For Isaacs will now, desist. Madam Speaker, uh, what we want to do is to maintain the red light for bigotry, to use the member who asked the question's uh, metaphor, but we want to remove the amber light. We want to remove the, the amber the light for, uh, for will free desist. speech. Uh, that's what All we're these, attempting to one do. Or the other. All of us deplore racism. Uh, we abhor bigotry. We want this country, uh, all of us, to be our best selves, and Australians at their best are a decent and welcoming people, but we're also a people who can engage in very robust free speech without fear of prosecution. I call the honourable member for Herbert. Here, here. Thank you, thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Prime Minister. How is the government, Prime Minister, easing cost of living pressures on Australian families? How much money would the average Australian families would average average Australian families save in the repeal of the carbon tax? I call the honourable the Prime Minister. Well, I do thank the member for Herbert for his question, and I do appreciate his concerns to ensure that the ordinary working families, uh, indeed, uh, uh, under the former government, the ordinary forgotten families of our country, get a fair go. Because, Madam Speaker. Uh, if there is one figure that should reverberate around this House every day until the carbon tax is finally repealed, it's $550 a year 
That's the additional burden that the families and the households of Australia face because of members opposite and their the carbon tax. Jagger, Jagger, now, Madam Speaker, what this government uh, wants to do, uh, what we are being prevented from doing by members opposite, is to scrap the carbon tax but keep the compensation uh, that the families and the households of Australia got. Uh, Madam Speaker, we want to do the right thing by the families of Australia. I just can't understand why, after everything that's happened, after the election that was so bitterly contested last year, why members opposite still are siding with the Greens and against the people in supporting this toxic tax. I just can't understand it because, Madam Speaker, members opposite know just the how bad this tax is uh, because Labor members uh, of uh, the Senate by-election team were proclaiming loudly in Perth last Thursday that they were, quote, scrapping the carbon tax, unquote. Well, on the very day they said they were scrapping the carbon tax in Perth, they were supporting the carbon tax here in Canberra. You just can't trust them, Madam Speaker. You just can't trust them. So, Madam Speaker, this is a government which is determined to ease the cost of living pressures on families, not just by scrapping bad taxes, not just by eliminating unnecessary regulation, but by boosting economic growth through sensible freer trade agreements uh, with our major trading partners. Madam Speaker, we are pursuing uh, fr a free trade agreement with Japan, a free trade agreement with China to complement the free trade agreement we have already secured with Korea. For this reason, trade means jobs. Freer trade benefits both countries. It benefits the buyer, it benefits the seller. It's good for workers and families in both countries, and that's what we want. We want a stronger and more prosperous Australia in a stronger and more prosperous world. I call the honourable member for Green Bay. Madam Speaker, my question is to the Prime Minister. Today, the Attorney General has announced that the Abbott government wants to remove important protections against bigotry. Is it the intention of this legislation to allow a person to be verbally attacked based on race on social networking sites? Yeah. I call the Honourable the Prime Minister. Well, Madam Speaker, uh, again, I, uh, I, I accept that this is a very important question, and I will do my best to, to deal with the member opposite's uh, question with the respect that it deserves. Of course, none of us want to see bigotry. None of us want to see bigotry. And the proposed change to section 18C the question has been asked. The Prime contains the call. a very strong prohibition <clears throat> on racial vilification. Uh, it, it, it contains a very strong prohibition on inciting racial hatred. It contains a very strong prohibition on any attempt to engage in racial intimidation, as it should, as it should. But it also provides for the appropriate protection of free speech. Now, that's not, that's not racial abuse. Uh, it just means that if we are having a legitimate discussion, uh, as we are entitled to in a free and robust democracy, such as ours, contributions to that discussion will not be pres prescribed by law. That's the balance that this government is, a is attempting, in good faith, to get right. The important balance between protections, which people are entitled to, and free speech, which people are also entitled to. I call the honourable member for Forrest. Thank you, Madam, thank you, Madam Speaker. My question is to the Treasurer. Will the Treasurer outline the impact of the carbon tax on Western Australia? How will repealing the carbon tax help Western Australia's key industries? Here, here. Very good question. I call the Honourable the Treasurer. I thank the member for Forrest for her question. <coughs> and I, like the Prime Minister, <coughs> do not understand why the Labor Party in opposition would try and defend the carbon tax. After promising before the 2010 election not to introduce a carbon tax, they then went 
after the election and introduced the carbon tax. And before the last election, they said they were going to terminate the carbon tax. Now they're voting to keep it. So they're entirely inconsistent with whatever they say before an election. And the impact on the people of Western Australia is significant. Last year alone, that's right, it is consistency, the interjection, I take it. It's consistent to be inconsistent. That's the Labor Party's approach. Because last year alone in Western Australia, the carbon tax cost Western Australians $600 million. $600 million. Even economic modelling commissioned by the Rudd Gillard Rudd government from Treasury identified that the impact, the negative impact, on the Western Australian economy would be significant. Manufacturing output, uh, manufacturing output would be hit. Uh, in fact, uh, if you get rid of the carbon tax, uh, manufacturing output in Western Australia will increase by nearly 3.5 per cent over the next 16 years. On the same basis, construction output in Western Australia will improve by nearly 1 per cent. Uh, gross state product in Western Australia will improve by nearly 1 per cent, and all because you get rid of the carbon tax. So keeping the carbon tax actually hurts Western Australia as keeping the carbon tax hurts Australia. It detracts from economic growth. And of course, GDP, gross domestic product, would be 0.3 per cent lower than otherwise in 2020 as a result of the carbon tax. Uh, and of course, it will cost the Australian economy $1 trillion by 2050 if the carbon tax remains in place. So, why doesn't the Labor Party want to get rid of the carbon tax? They go to Western Australia and say to the people of Western Australia, we're getting rid of the carbon tax. We're opposed to the carbon tax. Then they come back to Canberra and they vote to keep it. And only today, only an hour ago, in the Senate, the Labor Party is so appalled about the mining tax and its impact on Western Australia that a few minutes ago in the Senate they voted to keep the mining tax. A few minutes ago they voted. They really care about Western Australia because every time they come to Canberra they do everything they possibly can to make life harder for the people of Western Australia. I call the honourable member for Werriwa. Uh, Madam Speaker, my question is to the Prime Minister. The Attorney General has today announced that the Abbott government wants to give bigotry his blessing in Australia. It is it the intention of the government to allow a person to publish or broadcast racially derogatory comments which offend, insult and humiliate? The Leader of the House. Madam Speaker, I understand that you are giving licence to the uh, opposition because the Prime Minister is also generously prepared to answer these questions. But the simple truth of the matter is it is not acceptable for the member for Werriwa to call members of the opposition bigots. And for decades, as a Catholic, the people of my faith of opposition business were subjected to bigotry, and I find it particularly insulting, let alone new members of the House, from, from uh, races that have come to Australia more recently that also must find it galling. And I will not put up with it personally, and I ask you to have him withdraw it. There will be silence. Thank you. The Leader of the House is making a strong point, but I believe there is a stronger one. And in the interest of free speech, I will let the question stand <laughs> and call the Prime Minister. Well, thank you, uh, Madam Speaker. And uh, fair enough, we are capable of robust debate uh, in this place. I think Australians are capable of robust debate, and that's what I want to facilitate in this country. Robust the member for Charlton I want it to be civil. Warned. Of course I want it to be civil, but in the end, Madam Speaker, the truth is that when people are arguing things that they feel passionately about, it will inevitably be at times offensive, at times insulting. And I don't believe <laughs> I don't believe that the mere fact that someone might be put off uh, by what's being said should mean that, that person, so the person speaking should feel the full sanction of law against them. That's our position. Now, Madam Speaker, I reject any suggestion from the member who asked the question that Australia is a bigoted country. We are not. We are a decent, we are a decent and a fair country. 
Uh, yes, They'll be silent occasionally, on my left. Occasionally, 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 people give in to unworthy impulse in this country, as in others. But, Madam Speaker, we are the freest, the fairest, and the most decent country on earth. The manager of opposition business will resume his seat. The tactics have clearly been provocative, using the term bigot constantly. In the interest of free speech, I let the question stand, and we'll move to the next question. On what? First of all, on my right to take a point of order. Please don't shout. Well, Madam Speaker, as you've noted, there is some noise within the chamber. Usually coming from that direction. Well, that, that doesn't change the fact that I need to make sure I'm heard, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, understanding order 86. When someone stands, they have a right to be heard on a point of order, and to have the practice where you allow the Prime Minister the to conclude— The manager of opposition business will resume his seat. Can I not conclude? No, you may not. And I'll tell you why. And I'll tell you why. Resume your seat. I would suggest that the Leader of the Opposition reads the practice a little more carefully. He will find a whole section in there which will inform him as to when I may ignore someone who stands on a point of order or cut them short because there is a presumption about what is being done and how it is being used. So I would refer you to the practice for further reading. Now I call the Honourable Member for Petrie. Ah, the Prime Minister has not, cons has not completed his answer. The member for Petrie will resume his seat. The Prime Minister has the call. Madam Speaker, point of order. If he hasn't concluded his answer, this might be the one occasion I can take a point of order. If you do it properly. <laughs> on, the, on the issue of the way the word bigotry has been used. What the, is the point of order? The point of order is on proper conduct of this chamber, Madam Speaker. Then, uh, <laughs> The Manager of Opposition Business will resume his seat. The Prime Minister has the call. Thank you, thank you Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, I, I, I conclude with, uh, with this observation. Uh, no, one wants to see, no one wants to see bigotry or intolerance in our society. But, Madam Speaker, I say, I say this. The best counter to a bad argument is a good one, and the best antidote to bigotry is decency, is decency proclaimed by people engaging in a free and fair debate. I call the honourable member for Indi. Thank you, Madam Speaker. My question is to the Minister for Social Services, and it concerns support for aged care residents in rural communities. From the 1st of July 2014, a higher accommodation supplement will be paid for supported accommodation, provided the service is newly built, has met the criteria for refurbishment and a supported residence ratio of 40 per cent. Minister, can you please tell the House what arrangements are in place where population density prevents providers such as Glenview Community Service in Rutherglen from meeting the 40 per cent ratio? I call the Honourable the Minister for Social Services. Um, thank you, Madam Speaker, and I thank the member for Indi uh, for her question. Indeed, uh, being a frequent visitor to the seat of Indi, I was there in Mansfield uh, over the weekend. And um, can I say, having um, having grown up in rural Victoria and having family in rural Victoria, um, I share her concerns about uh, the plight of residents and particularly the aged residents of uh, rural parts uh, of Australia. Uh, to come to a question. Uh, it is true that the government pays an accommodation supplement to assist low wealth residents who can't meet the normal cost of aged care. And in, in order to encourage aged care providers to take in more low wealth residents into their homes, then it pays that supplement where, as you pointed out to the member for Indi, 40 per cent of the residents are of low wealth. Uh, as defined by uh, the legislation and the regulations. In those situations uh, which you allude to, uh, the member for Indi alludes to, where less than 40 per cent of the residents of a particular aged care home are deemed to be low wealth individuals, that in those circumstances, rather than the 100 per cent of the aged care supplement being paid, 75 per cent of the aged care supplement is paid. And as I understand from the latest data, that amounts to that 75 per cent amounts to about $25 per person per day. So in addition to the 
other payments which are received by the aged care provider, where less than 40 per cent of the residents are deemed to be low-wealth individuals, then a payment of approximately $25 per person per day um, is paid. Now, it's true that uh, there are some further changes coming in from July 1, which reflect upgrading of particular residential uh, accommodation uh, in various parts uh, of Australia. Can I simply add to what I've explained by way in which the system works? Is that the government has asked the uh, Australian, uh, uh, the Aged Care Financial Authority, to advise us on the support of low wealth individuals, uh, not only in rural areas of Australia, but indeed right across Australia, in terms of their accommodation in aged care. Uh, and finally, we're also examining the needs um, of rural aged care services uh, in relation to the election commitment we made to repurpose the aged care workforce supplement. And the government has that matter under consideration uh, at the present time, but I can advise the member for INDI and indeed all other representatives of rural and regional uh, parts of Australia uh, that, is, that is under active consideration at the present time. And finally, uh, as the member for INDI raised matters concerning her electorate, uh, I'm not sure if she knows, but the Deputy Prime Minister recently approved a community development grant for the Bright Hospital uh, to look at the feasibility of the redevelopment of that hospital. Minister's time has expired. Before I call the honourable member for Isaacs, I wish to advise the House that we have visiting with us uh, currently the Right Honourable David Carter, the Speaker of the, House of the New Zealand House of Representatives. We also have present with us the, New the Clerk of the New Zealand Parliament, Ms Mary Harris. We make you both very welcome. We also have the Honourable Chris Pearce, the former member for Aston and former Parliamentary Secretary and Shadow Minister. And delightfully, we have uh, Mr Gerard Neesham, the CEO, uh, and Ross Kelly, the chairman of the Clontaf uh, Association. And with them are Ty Gordon, Nathan Johnson and Charlie McHugh from Brewarrina. And we make you very welcome on this day. Welcome to this house. And the member for Petrie has the call. Well, thank you, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, my question is to the Treasurer. Will the Treasurer please outline the outlook for the coming budget? How will repairing the budget help everyday Australians? I call the Honourable the Treasurer. I thank the Honourable Member for Petrie for his question and note that the only way we can start strengthening the Australian economy is to start strengthening the Australian budget. And we inherited from Labor $123 billion of deficits, $667 billion of debt, unless we actually, unless we actually are allowed to get on with the job of strengthening the budget. Now, the budget is presented uh, for a four-year period. That has been uh, what is happening for some period of time. And at the last election, the Labor Party said that the deficit this year would be $47 billion, uh, and subsequently after that it's $47 billion, $34 billion in the second year, $24 billion deficit in the third year, and $18 billion deficit in the fourth year. In the upcoming budget in May, for the first time, the fifth year comes in. And when we were in opposition, we continually pointed out that Labor was pushing a tsunami of new spending into the fifth year. For the first time, we are starting to get a picture of it. In the fifth year, we have, in real terms, an increase in education expenditure of 3.5 per cent. Labor said it wouldn't be more than 2 per cent. In health, an increase of 4.2 per cent. Labor said it wouldn't be more than 2 per cent. In defence, an increase of 13 per cent in one year back-ended expenditure by Labor, they said it wouldn't be more than 2 per cent. Overseas aid, foreign aid, Labor backloaded in the fifth year a 66 per cent increase in foreign aid in that year, and of course in disability spending a 125 per cent increase as the NDIS scheme comes into play and it wasn't properly paid for. So there is no surprise here that Labor engaged in insidious activity to hide the fact that they were burying in the out years, burying beyond the election, 
a massive tsunami of increase in expenditure, and they have no shame. They have no shame about it. There's no sense of embarrassment. The IMF surveyed 17 leading countries and identified that the Labor Party left the biggest increase in expenditure of the 17 top IMF countries in the world. The biggest increase in expenditure, the fastest increase in debt of the 17 surveyed nations. That's the Labor legacy. Well, I say to the people of Australia and I say to all the members of the House, we are going to set about fixing this problem in the best interests of the Australian people. I call the honourable member for Isaacs. My question is to the Prime Minister. Can the Prime Minister explain whether the following racist bigotry would be prohibited under the government's proposal? I refer to the case of Jones and Tobin, in which infamous Holocaust denier Frederick Tobin stated that there is serious doubt that the Holocaust occurred, that it is unlikely that there were homicidal gas chambers at Auschwitz, that Jewish people who are offended by and challenge Holocaust denial are of limited intelligence, and other matters I will not repeat. Tobin said he was engaging in discussion of the Holocaust. Is the PM aware these statements breached section 18C? I call the honourable the Prime Minister. Well, Madam Speaker, I make the point that the statements that have been quoted across this chamber uh, by the Shadow Minister are abhorrent, uh, they're offensive and they're wrong. They're abhorrent, they're offensive and they're wrong. The question has been asked uh, now what we're doing, while the Prime Minister what, what, what the government uh, is proposing to do is to maintain the red light on inciting racial hatred, but we are removing the amber light on free speech, which Section 18C in its current form uh, maintains. That's what we're doing. Now, um, we, are, uh, we, we, we are also attempting to engage the community in this, uh, as you'd expect. We are attempting to engage the community in this. Uh, I, point out, I point out, Madam Speaker, to the member opposite uh, that what we have proposed today uh, is an exposure draft of legislation. We are looking forward to further engagement with the community uh, based on the engagement that we have with the community over the next 30 days. Uh, we will um, finalise the legislation and bring it into the parliament in the budget session. I call the honourable member for O'Connor. Uh, thank you, Madam Speaker. My question is to the Deputy Prime Minister and Minister for Infrastructure and Regional Development. Will the minister update the House on what support is available to assist councils with local road upgrades and maintenance, particularly in my electorate of O'Connor? Is the minister aware of any impediments to this assistance being delivered? I call the honourable the Deputy Prime Minister and Minister for Infrastructure and Regional Development. Well, thank you very much, Madam Speaker, and may I thank the honourable member for his question. He represents um, an electorate almost the size of New South Wales. Mm. I was there over the weekend and appreciated how important it is to have, an, have a road network that's able to deliver services and, and, and uh, take, take away the exports from that highly productive region. In particular, the local roads are very, very important to electorates like Kalgoorlie. And indeed, the, the Roads to Recovery program has been one of the most popular programs, to, particularly amongst local government, right across the government since it was instituted by the, by the Howard Anderson government. It was a program that was actually carried through the Rudd and the, and the Gillard and the Rudd governments, one of the few programs that was carried through. And now the coalition government is committed to, to a further $1.75 billion for the Roads Recovery Program to help local councils with their roads and streets right across the nation. It's a popular program, and I've heard Labor members uh, saying how valuable it is and how they supported it. I was amazed, therefore, yesterday in the House of Representatives that the Labor Party voted against the legislation to continue the Roads Recovery Program for another five years. They voted against the legislation, which will enable that vital road and local street work to continue. Now, what we have to remember, of course, is if this particular legislation is not passed through the Senate, then the Roads to Recovery program will end. Labor and Greens combined 
They voted against it in the House of Representatives and certainly have indicated their intention to vote against it also in the Senate. What the people of O'Connor need to realise and the people of Western Australia, which will receive about $55 million every year for local roads and streets under this program, if they vote in senators who are not prepared to support the land transport uh, bill that went, uh, that went through the House of Representatives yesterday, if they are not prepared to support that bill, th this much-loved program right across the nation will end. Will end. Without the Greens and the Labor Party voting for this in the Senate, unless there are senators there who will support the Roads to Recovery program, this program will come to an end. And so there's a very clear message again that, that Labor candidates, Labor members and senators say one thing in Western Australia, say one thing when they're visiting regional councils, but when they had the opportunity yesterday to declare I'm their support for the Roads to Recovery program, they actually voted to terminate the program. They voted that it should not proceed. What is essential for regional Australians, people who live in the suburbs of Australia, is that they elect senators who will vote this legislation in. I call the honourable member for Isaacs. Thank you, Madam Speaker. My question is to the Prime Minister. Can the Prime Minister name which ethnic community organisations support the government's proposed changes to the Racial Discrimination Act? I call the honourable the Prime Minister. Madam Speaker, uh, as I uh, as I said, uh, this is legislation, uh, draft legislation, uh, which has gone out for consultation with the community. Uh, we think that the legislation the Jagger, Jagger. gets the balance right. We think that the legislation preserves protections while removing any element of sense. The manager of opposition business on a point of order. On direct relevance, Madam Speaker, the question had no preamble. And if the, pri the only organisation the Prime Minister is referring to is his own cabinet at the moment, and the question uh, was asking for something broader than that. Order. Prime Minister has the call. And Madam Speaker, let's see what various community organisations uh, uh, say in response to the exposure legislation that uh, we're making available. But I'll, but I'll say this, uh, I'll say this, Madam Speaker. I know the migrant communities of Australia pretty well. And I, know, and I know that they have voted for this country with their feet. I know that they have embraced our way of life, they have embraced our Australian system, and part of our system is robust freedom of speech. I call the honourable member for Canning. Madam Speaker, Madam Speaker, my question is addressed to the Treasurer. How will abolishing the mining tax assist to grow the economy and create jobs? I call the honourable the treasurer. Well, I thank the honourable member for the question and note from day one he's been opposed to the mining tax. Here, here. From day one, and day one the coalition has been opposed to the mining tax. And what a horrible birth this tax had. I mean, I uh, well recall Colin Barnett, the premier of Western Australia, the Liberal premier of Western Australia, ringing up Prime Minister Rudd and asking him what could he possibly be thinking to introduce a tax like that. And Kevin Rudd responded it was all Wayne Swan's idea. <laughs> and so the architect of the tax, which has been a complete unmitigated disaster for the Labor Party, is still in the Labor Party, still in opposition, still in parliament, and still supporting upholding a tax that has been an abject failure. In a hundred years' time, in a hundred years' time, when tax classes are taught at university, they'll go back and say, Mr Professor, what was the worst tax that was ever designed? What was the worst tax that was ever designed? And the professor will respond, it was the five versions of the mining tax. The carbon tax is close, but, but there was only one version of the carbon tax. Five versions of a mining tax that originally was meant to raise $12.5 billion next year, and at the end of the day, at the end of the day, is hardly raising anything. Hardly raising anything. The problem is Labor spent the money they never got. $16 billion of expenditure. $16 billion they pre-committed, pre-spent against a tax that barely raises a dollar. That is irresponsible budgeting. You wouldn't do it in your home, let alone for the nation. But Labor 
did, because that's the Labor way. And the other part of the Labor way is this unholy partnership with the Greens, because it was the Greens that they relied on to get passage of the mining tax. It was the Greens that they relied on an hour ago in the Senate to oppose the repeal of the mining tax. It's the Greens that supported them to deliver a carbon tax, and it's the Greens that supported Labor to uphold the carbon tax. The only way, the only way to get rid of the mining tax is to vote for the Liberals and the Nationals in the upcoming Senate election in Western Australia. The only way to get rid of the carbon tax is to vote for the Liberals and the Nationals in the Senate in the upcoming election in Western Australia. The only way to send a message to the Labor Party is never vote for them and never support them. But even then, even then, they still stand by bad policy that costs jobs and costs families income. I call the Honourable Leader of the Opposition. Thank you, Madam Speaker. My question is to the Prime Minister. The Attorney General today has announced that the Abbott government wants to change laws which protect Australians from bigotry and hate speech. Prime Minister, why is removing, why is removing anti-racism laws which have protected Australians for almost 20 years such a high priority of the Abbott government? I call the Honourable the Prime Minister. Well, Madam Speaker, it's certainly not the only priority of this government. Uh, our priority is scrapping the carbon tax yeah. uh, and boosting families' income. It's scrapping the mining tax and boosting investment and jobs. It's cutting red tape and boosting productivity and economic activity. It's getting freer trade agreements in place so that our agricultural exporters will get a fair go at last in the wider world. So, Madam Speaker, we are advancing on a wide front to the rescue of this nation. That's what we are doing, Madam Speaker. But part, part of what we are doing is <laughs> the leader of the opposition will desist. Madam Speaker, the leader Madam Speaker, of the opposition will desist. Madam Speaker, let me just point out to the leader of the opposition that the repeal of Section 18C in its Marjorie. current form was a policy and a position that we took to the last election. Uh, it, was, it was in place for at least 12 months. It was in place for at least 12 months uh, before the last election, and now the leader of the opposition is choosing to play politics and attempt an attempt to try to engage in a bit of dog whistling uh, on this issue, just like they engage in a bit of dog whistling on, on 457 visas. Yeah, the best friend of the, the right to be a bigot. The manager of opposition so business has the call. Thank you, Madam Speaker. That comment should be withdrawn from the oh, Prime Minister. Yeah, yeah. That comment should be withdrawn. In this, the people who are giving permission for racism ask, should not be using terms like I that. I would ask the manager of opposition business to resume his seat. The leader of the House. Speaker. Madam Speaker, we are not going to be lectured by the party of the Carol and Habib leaflet in the South Australian state election campaign. The hypocrites on the other side should withdraw the statements they made earlier in question time. There'll be silence. There'll be silence. The Prime Minister has the call. Now, Madam Speaker, let me make it absolutely crystal clear. Uh, I believe that uh, members opposite are serious about wanting to protect and preserve free speech, but I hope they will also believe that members on this side of the chamber are serious about wanting to ensure that there is no place for racism in our society. And that's why what we are doing with the exposure draft legislation that we released today is clearly prohibiting racial vilification, clearly prohibiting racial intimidation, but providing for reasonable debate in the robust democracy that this country is. I call the honourable member for Karangamai. Uh, thank you, Madam Speaker. My question is to the Minister for Education representing the Minister for Employment. I refer to the sentence handed down against the former Labor member for Debell, 
Craig Thompson in the Melbourne Magistrates Court today after he was found guilty of defrauding members of the Health Services Union. What is the government doing to combat fraud, corruption and other illegal activity in the union movement? I call the Honourable the Minister for Education, representing the member for Education, and the member for Perth will desist. The minister has the call. Thank you, Madam Speaker, and I thank the member for Karangamite for her question, and I can inform the House, more in sorrow than in anger, that the former member for Dobell, uh, Mr Craig Thompson, has been sentenced in the Melbourne Magistrates Court today to 12 months imprisonment with nine months suspended, so he'll serve three months in jail, uh, and a two-year good behaviour bond for the theft of $24,000 from members of the Health Services Union. This is a very sad day, Madam Speaker, for the parliament. It's a sad day that one of the former members of this place has fallen so far in the estimation of its society that it is, he is going to jail for theft. It is a particularly sad day for the once great Labor Party and the Labor movement that one of their own that they nurtured, brought into parliament and then protected until April 2012 has been sentenced to jail today. It's a great sadness that the once great party of Chifley and Curtin is now the party of Obeid and Macdonald and Williamson and Thompson. But it also represents an opportunity for the opposition to join us, to join the government in passing the Registered Organisations Commission Bill in the Senate, which he is currently blocking, to pass the Australian Building and Construction Commission Bill in the Senate that he is currently blocking, to full-throatedly support the Royal Commission into union corruption and thuggery. And, Madam Speaker, perhaps you should take some advice from Martin Ferguson, another great family of the Labor movement, one of whom still sits in this place, but this one who had to say on the 28th of February, the Labor Party's got to change and our relationship with the union movement's got to change, both internally and externally, because it's not the union movement I grew up in. Now, if the Leader of the Opposition took that advice and the advice from Paul Howes, who's also known to support severing the ties between the union movement and the Labor Party, he would be able to show that he was standing on his own two feet, that he wasn't just a puppet of the union movement. He should sever his ties with the union movement, as advised by Paul Howes and Martin Ferguson, make a clean break with people like the Health Services Union, people like Williamson and Thompson from the Health Services Union, from the stain of the obeyed and Macdonald stain that sits on the Labor Party. And while he's at it, to really prove that he'd separated himself from the dodgy aspects of the union movement, he'd pay back the $267,000 of Health Service Union members' money that was used to elect Craig Thompson in 2007 to this place. And it would be cheap. It would be cheap for him to do that. It would be a sign of good faith with those members of the HSU and I call on him to do so and be a big enough man to do so. I call the Honourable the Deputy Leader of the Check Opposition. Thank you, Madam Speaker. My question is to the Prime Minister. What is the government's policy on increasing official development assistance to 0.5 per cent of gross national income, and when will the government reach that target? I call the Honourable the, the, member, the Prime Minister. Minister. You kept pushing it out to the fifth yeah. year. Yes, the Prime Lord, Minister has Lord. the call. The question has been asked. We'll have silence on my right as well. The Prime Minister has the call. Well, Madam Speaker, that particular aspiration was uh, pushed out every year by members opposite uh, when they were in government. Uh, it remains uh, the aspiration of this government. But, Madam Speaker, the first duty of this government is to bring the budget back into sustainable surplus. Here, here. To bring the budget back into sustainable surplus. Uh, once the budget is back in sustainable surplus, then we will reconsider this matter of 0.5 per cent of GNI. In the meantime, in the meantime, Madam Speaker, uh, we will generally be increasing foreign aid uh, by CPI. I call the honourable member for Tangney. Thank you, Madam Speaker. My question is to the Assistant Minister for Education. Will the minister outline how the administration of the Early Years Quality Fund 
impacted on childcare centres in Western Australia. What is the government doing to make childcare affordable, flexible and available in my home state? I call the Honourable the Assistant Minister for Education. Uh, thank you, Madam Speaker, and, and thank you to the member for Tangney for his question and his concern about childcare affordability in, West, in Western Australia. And I'm sure he's also interested in the Auditor General confirming that his office will officially examine and scrutinise Labor's $300 million early years quality fund. That was the fund that wasn't about the early years, wasn't about quality, was about $300 million of hijacked taxpayers' money in pursuit of union recruitment. And the independent PricewaterhouseCoopers report said many things, including that Labor's EYQF was inherently unfair, inequitable and drove a greater pay divide in the centre. Now, Madam Speaker, in, in Western the Australia, there's, the will in WA, there's 1,348. In, uh, the member for Adelaide is quite welcome to ask me questions without notice any question time. Um, <laughs> the member in for WA, Adelaide there are will 13... desist or leave. The member for Adelaide is warned. Uh, in WA, uh, Madam Speaker, there's 1,348 <laughs> childcare centres. Of those, 510 are long day care centres. So, under the member for Adelaide's policy, 838 were out in the cold from the word go. They could never have, have applied. They weren't grounds for union recruitment drives. Only 5% of the. The member for Griffith will oh, assist or leave. Only 5% of the workforce was even allocated a slice of the action under Labor's so called early years quality fund. But interestingly enough, uh, the unions were front and centre of this member for Adelaide, and they're also front and centre for the me member for Adelaide's re-election campaign because, um, in uh, a Daily Telegraph the member report, for Kingsford Smith is warned. The in member a for Daily Kingsford Telegraph Smith will report, leave under 94A. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> I refer. I refer to. Refer to refer to a report in the Daily Telegraph in August 2013 which said that a confidential email intended for members of United Voice this week demanded that childcare workers join Ms Ellis's campaign team and doorknock residents signing up the workers. But that wasn't all, um, Madam Speaker, in a, in a, in a shameful misuse, in a shameful misuse of the member for Adelaide's ministerial position. She, in the dying days of the 2013 campaign, Sent home flyers. The member for Adelaide is warned. Sent Does she wish to leave now? Oh, no. No. Then she will the, leave uh, right now under 94A. In a, in the minister will resume her seat. Uh, the uh, member for Isaacs on a point of order. Ma Madam Speaker. The manager of opposition business. I I'm just trying to work out the ruling you just gave. You asked a member of parliament if they would like to leave. They answered your question and no you threw her out the the for interjecting. Of opposition business will when the interjection his seat was now, he will answer. He will resume his seat or leave himself. The minister has the call. Uh, yes, sir. The minister will resume her seat. This better not be just to uh, interrupt proceedings. The minister, the member for Isaacs. Madam Speaker, you have not heard me. You cannot possibly tell to. what I am going to, to say. And you do need to. Order. You do need to listen. It's your job. The member for Isaac will leave under 94A. The minister has the call. Uh, from, from the member for Adelaide to childcare centres on the eve of the election, pr please print this flyer, put it in parents' pigeonholes, stick it up in your centre before pick-up time. A shameful misuse of a ministerial position. Call the honourable member for McMahon. Thank you, Madam Speaker. My question is to the Treasurer, and I refer the Treasurer to the Prime Minister's answer a moment ago, which the Prime Minister said that official development assistance will reach 0.5 per cent of GNI when the budget returns to surplus, and refer to this as, and I quote, an aspiration. If this is the case, why did the Treasurer's mid-year economic forecast say that Official development assistance will breach this target in 2017. Is this another example of the Treasurer cooking the books to artificially inflate debt and deficit? I call the Honourable the Treasurer. The 
There will be signs on my right and left. I'll be silent. The treasurer has the call. Talk about cooking the books. It's like an episode of Master Chef over there. Where do you go? I mean, there you got some of the best. The member for Lily, he, he really cooked them. He overcooked them. He promised a surplus. And then, 300 times he promised a surplus. I've heard of a, surf, a souffle rising twice, but not 300 times. And then along comes another chef. Another. The Treasurer will resume his seat. Uh, the member for Hunter on a point of order. A point of order on relevance, Madam Speaker. The question was que well, clearly about the Treasurer's MoEFO, not about anything that's happening thank on this you. side the of the House. Every seat. I'm afraid when a question is asked about cooking the books, that's the sort of answer you'll get. I call the Honourable the Treasurer. And of course, along came the member for McMahon. And the, the member books were so Brand cooked, he piled desist. on the mustard, he piled on the horseradish. He piled on the barbecue sauce. Can't take too the member for Hunter on a point of order that is not about relevance. Well, in my view, Madam Speaker, I think you I would agree. You, the term cooking the books order. brings certain imputations, and I uh, ask you to bring the Treasurer back to the subject he's been asked. <laughs> the member for Hunter. <laughs> I, I, think, I think the member for Hunter is good spirited. He's having a sense of fun. The, uh, me, the honourable the treasurer has the call. Well, the problem is, Madam Speaker, the Labor Party cooked the books, and the rest of Australia got food poisoning. <laughs> Talk about cooking the books! Labor was adept at it, and they still don't understand how to put the recipe together. The member for McMahon. The member, the member for, for McMahon. McMahon doesn't understand the recipe. The member for he McMahon came into this place the all indignant about debt. Assist. The member for McMahon doesn't even know the, the difference between net debt and gross debt. He doesn't even understand the recipe. And yet, and yet, the Labor Party has the gall to come in and say we've cooked the books. The member for Griffiths it was the Labor Party the that kept a. promising a surplus. It was the Labor Party that kept making big heroic promises about the economy that were never delivered. Every single number Labor published for six years was wrong. Every single number. And it was not just their own incompetence, it was Labor Party deceit. It was Labor Party deceit, shuffling payments and shuffling revenue from year to year in order to try and manufacture a surplus. And they believed their own cooking. They believed their own cooking. They went out there and said, "We've delivered a surplus." They didn't even. They didn't even pretend. The didn't member for Kingston Smith. That, well, they were Sorry, to do member it. for Kingston. They actually went out there and told the Australian people and paid for it using taxpayers' money. They said to the Australian people, "We have delivered a surplus. We have delivered a surplus." Well, you know the fact is. They were just $123 billion short. That's a big number for you, the isn't it? The member for McMahon on a point of order. Is the Treasurer intending to mention overseas uh, development assistance at any point in relation to McMahon the question? The member McMahon will resume his seat. There is no point of order. That is an abuse of the standing orders. The Treasurer has the call. A terrible question. I'd say to the member for McMahon, no matter how much he cries out, he won't find any aid overseas. I call the honourable member for Pearce. Thank you, Madam Speaker. My question is to the Assistant Minister for Infrastructure and Regional Development. How is the government building a stronger and more prosperous Western Australia without relying on a mining tax? I call the honourable the Assistant Minister for Regional Development and, region, and uh, Regional Development. Infrastructure. Sorry. Thank you, uh, Madam Speaker, and uh, thank you to the member for Pearce and what a terrific addition he is to our side of the house from Western Australia. Uh, a great background and uh, he will make a, a significant contribution, we're sure, on this side of the uh, house. And I can say to the member for Pearce, the infrastructure Prime Minister is going to help you with your seat because he is, he is ensuring that the Swan Valley bypass will be built with money out of the budget, not out of an imagination 
uh, an imaginary mining tax revenue which doesn't exist. The Great Northern Highway upgrades which benefit his electorate will also be built. Those projects will go ahead because they are important projects for Western Australia's future and they will deliver higher economic performance and ensure that our mining industry can be as, uh, as successful as those of us on our side of the House want it to be. We don't think continuing to put uh, pressure on the mining industry by additional taxes, whether it be the mining tax or the carbon tax, is the best way to, to run an economy. We think taking pressure off business, red tape off business, taking off unnecessary taxes off business will help us deliver the infrastructure of the 21st century so we can grow more quickly. And of course, it's the other side of the House who thinks that putting a mining tax in place that doesn't raise any revenue uh, and then allocating it against projects is the best way to run an economy. And it is today, the three-year anniversary since the designer-in-chief of the mining tax, the brains behind the operation on that side of the House, came up with the mining tax on this quote, where he said, uh, he said Madam Speaker, uh, if you don't have revenue from the mining tax, this is the member for Lilly, if you don't have the revenue from the tax, then you can't make the investments. That's what he said three years ago today, on the 25th of March 2011. If you don't have the revenue from the tax, you can't make the investments. Well, Madam Speaker, we don't have the revenue from the tax. The $12 billion estimated next year and the trickle that will come into the budget, but we're delivering the infrastructure because the infrastructure, Prime Minister, knows that you need to put in place the infrastructure of the 21st century so you have a stronger economy, uh, Madam Speaker. And the member for Lilly, he was responsible for the mining tax. He was responsible for the debt and deficit that our country is now burdened under. He was responsible for the deal on the carbon tax that left the Labor Party in opposition. Uh, on this side, we're going to ensure that we've got an economy which is growing, an economy which has got the least amount of tax that it needs be applied to it, and we're going to get rid of unnecessary taxes. You're very excited, Tanya. The, the super clinics question is coming. Well, Don't worry. It's on its way. The, correct titles. the member will refer to mem members by their correct titles. Thank you, uh, Madam Speaker. It is, of course, uh, the government will abolish the mining tax. It's necessary for us to abolish the mining tax, but we need the Labor Party to listen to the Australian people and get out of the way so we can continue to deliver infrastructure, pro infrastructure, infrastructure, <laughs> projects, for, infrastructure projects for the member for Pearce and for Western Australia, Madam Speaker. That's what we're elected to do, and that's what the infrastructure prime minister will deliver. Before I call the honourable member for McMahon, We'll have some quiet, thank you. Earlier today, I welcomed the uh, uh, Speaker of the House of Representatives from New Zealand. Um, he was at that stage not in the House, but I'm delighted to say he's now on the floor of the House. And we particularly extend to you a very warm welcome, together with the Clerk of the House, who is in the gallery. Welcome. I call the Honourable Member for McMahon. Thank you very much, Madam Speaker. My question is to the Treasurer. I refer the Treasurer to his recent statements that there are $123 billion in cumulative deficits over the forward estimates. Can the Treasurer confirm that more than half this figure, or $68 billion, has actually occurred due to spending decisions or changes in economic assumptions made on his watch? I call the Honourable the Treasurer. Our budget, uh, as released in the mid-year economic and fiscal outlook, was right. Uh, the numbers were right. Every number Labor produced for six years was wrong. And a little bit earlier, a little bit earlier, the member for McMahon, before I ran out of time, he asked me about foreign aid. Uh, the Labor Party cut $5.7 billion out of foreign aid in the last 15 months in government. And the, the reason why McMahon the member for McMahon wants to look as to whether he would be the beneficiary of foreign aid, because under Labor, Australia became the third biggest beneficiary of its own foreign aid program. Can you believe that? They were spending foreign aid in Australia. In Australia. We became the third biggest recipient of our own foreign aid program under Labor. The member so please, please, spare us, spare us and spare the Australian the people the rank assist. hypocrisy of the Labor Party. Australians have had enough. The Labor Party got every number wrong. They engaged in deceit and deception when it came to the budget. Our numbers are fed income, and we are being fed income with the Australian people. I call the honourable member for Dirac. Thank you, Madam Speaker. My question is to the Minister for Communications. What challenges does the government face in delivering broadband to the people of remote Western Australia, including the people in my electorate of Dirac? 
I call the Honourable the Minister for Communication. Thank you, Madam Speaker, and I thank the Honourable Member for her question. The Labor Party promised 250,000 Australians the that they would be eligible for I'm the sorry, interim. Labor promised 250,000 Australians they'd be eligible for the interim satellite service, but only bought capacity to service 48,000. They promised the service would deliver six megs down, one up, for the same price as the city ADSL service. And as the honourable member for Dirac knows, most of the 5,600 interim satellite users in Western Australia now are getting no better and often worse than dial-up speeds. Kids can't do their homework, farmers can't access the online national livestock identification system, real-time prices or weather services. The $351 million interim satellite service of Labor has been a train wreck. It, the 45,000 unhappy current customers are costing the taxpayers of this nation $7,300 each in direct subsidy. That is nearly three times the level of the old Howard-era Australian broadband guarantee subsidy and for a much worse service. Now, Madam Speaker, it is our job to clean up Labor's messes, including the Conrovian ones. But I have to say that many, including this one, do not lend themselves to an easy or obvious solution. Indeed, the previous minister washed his hands of this in the previous, last few months of his ministry. Well, here are the measures that we are announcing today. First, at the cost of $18.4 million, the NBN Co will upgrade the current capacity to all users on the satellite service by one third. Second, we will institute a new stringent fair use policy to ensure a minority of very heavy users cannot crowd out the majority. The NBN Co's trials of these changes demonstrate that even in busy periods, families will be able to answer their emails, surf the web, do their banking, see their kids complete their homework. It will not be as fast as the speeds promised, but never delivered by Labor. But it will be broadband and much higher, and certainly not anywhere near, the anemic dial-up speeds experienced at present. We are also working on additional measures to provide new services so that at least some of those, about 9,000 in total, who have Member not been able to get on will be able to do so. And we'll have more to say about that in coming days when the arrangements are complete. And, Madam Speaker, you might well ask whether these changes, these measures were not undertaken by the previous minister. Maybe they were suggested to them. But as the former deputy chair of NBN Co today, when I was, said Diane Smith Gander, when asked whether the board had ever suggested to Stephen Conroy should conduct a cost benefit analysis, she simply the said, think about the no the, the minister will resume his seat. I call the Leader of the Opposition. Uh, my questions to the Prime Minister. I refer to the Treasurer's December comments that the government will have to make difficult choices in the budget. Which is more important to the Prime Minister? Giving four high-income earners an extra $75,000 in PPL or giving $211 to the children of war veterans? Why is the government prioritising cutting the payments of the children of war veterans, including orphans. I call the honourable the Prime Minister. Well, Madam Speaker, um, this is a government that will repair the budget, but it is also a government that will keep its commitments. And some of the commitments that we made were quite tough, uncompromising commitments uh, that involved making serious savings, including savings that a lot of people wouldn't like. And, Madam Speaker, even though the income support bonus goes to some 1.3 million Australians, we had the courage to say pre-election that it wouldn't be continued under a coalition government because a coalition government does not believe in spending what it doesn't have. You cannot give people benefits endlessly on the nation's credit card, and that's the problem with members opposite. They have engaged in a species the of intergenerational theft. That's what they have engaged in. Uh, under members opposite, there was $123 billion of cumulative debt, $667 billion uh, 
of, 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 of debt, $123 billion of accumulated deficits. That's the problem that we are wrestling with. Now, Madam Speaker, we will not shirk the difficult decisions needed to engage in the job of fiscal repair because we understand and we believe the Australian people understand that if you want to fix the economy, you've got to fix the budget first, and that is exactly what this government will do. I call the honourable leader. I seek leave to move the following motion. That so much of standing and sessional orders be suspended as would prevent notices numbers one to two, private members' business relating to the disallowance of one, the Military Rehabilitation and Compensation Act Education and Training Scheme, Income Support Bonus Repeal Determination 2014, made under subsections 258, 4 and 5 of the Military Rehabilitation and Compensation Act 2004, and two, the Veterans Children Education Scheme Income Support Bonus Repeal Instrument 2014, made under subsections 117, 2 and subsections 3 of the Veterans Entitlements Act 1986, being called on immediately and considered together, with separate questions being put on each at the conclusion of the debate. Call the Leader of the House. There's no, no leave is not granted, Madam Speaker. Leave is not granted. The Honourable the Leader of the Opposition. So, okay. If I move that so much, I move that so much of standing and session orders be suspended as would prevent notices numbers one to two, private members' business relating to the disallowance of the Military Rehabilitation and Compensation Act Education and Training Scheme. Income Support Bonus Repeal Determination 2014, made under subsections 258, 4 and 5 of the Military Rehabilitation and Compensation Act 2004, and two, the Veterans Children's Education Scheme Income Support Bonus Repeal Instrument 2014, made under subsections 117, 2 and 3 of the Veterans Entitlements Act 1986 being called on immediately and considered together, with separate questions being put on each at the conclusion of the debate. The proposal of the government to target cuts to the orphans of veterans is a terrible mistake. And this is an arrogant government who can never admit that they are ever wrong. See, I understand deep down that there will be many members of the government who probably think, my goodness, what are we doing this to a group of 1,200 orphans? The Prime Minister used an expression earlier today about the, the figures which reverberate around the House. Well, let me talk about some figures which reverberate around this House. $211 going to 1,239 orphans or children whose parents have either been severely incapacitated or died in the service of this country. That is the number that matters to this side of the House. $211 going to 1,239 people, kids, which would cost the government $260,000. $260, the number which reverberates around that side of the House shows that they are a government of the wrong priorities. They would say, and they would have you believe, that somehow there is more integrity in providing millionaires $75,000 each extra, which they haven't asked for, rather than giving the children of veterans $211. So the reasons why we seek this figure, we seek that this be disallowed, is one, the decision is just not worth the pain you're inflicting on people. Two, it is a shifty decision. It is a decision which, despite the too much protestation of the Prime Minister, who couldn't be bothered staying in the parliament to defend his attack on veterans' orphans, too busy, no doubt, looking for more gold-plated schemes for people who don't need the money. What's in fact happened is that this is a shifty measure. The third thing is—oh, there's the member for Karangamite—hasn't fought for any work with Alcoa's job or Blue Circle. Now she's got plenty of advice to give. You just wait till the next election. The third reason why this is a bad decision is it is poor the priorities. Will Thank you, Madam Speaker. These are poor priorities. What I do not understand is what sort of twisted priorities could come up with the idea, and I could just imagine them high-fiving in their depleted expenditure review committee. Why on earth didn't we? Why on earth are we making a decision where we will give 5.5 billion dollars 
in a paid parental leave scheme. The member which will resume his seat. The Leader of the House. Madam Speaker, this is a debate about why standing orders should be suspended. In other words, why there should be no more debate on the government's program until this matter has been dealt with. This is a debate about a suspension of standing orders. It's not a debate about the actual measure that the Leader of the Opposition is talking about. And I've been very generous for the last four minutes, but he needs to actually explain why standing orders should be suspended. Uh, when we well, why suspending because I'm upholding it. Why, why we should be suspending standing orders? It's because of the decision to go after veterans' orphans is shifty, because the figures don't add up, because it reflects poor priorities, and it also is not the desired position of all of the people who day by day stand by veterans' orphans. This is not just a question of Labor being critical of the government. I look at the quote and I look at the quote that the Prime Minister said to Legacy on the 18th of October. And that champion then of orphans said, and the orphans of those who've paid the highest possible price in the service of our country, they should be cared for. And then he says later on, but we were prepared to, tough pol to put tough policies up front. Where on earth did the government, when they're in opposition, ever say? that they are necking the benefits to go to veterans' orphans. That document does not exist. They know they never spilled it out. But what I do quote here is Don Rowe, the president of the New South Wales RSL. He captures it articulately in two or three words. Absolutely disgusted, mean-spirited, penny-pinching exercise. Then I look at the Defence Forces Welfare Association spokesperson who said he was, and I quote him, bloody stunned. He said there's a lot of things that can be ripped away, and he doesn't even like the mining tax. But he says to target kids, and only about 1,200 of them, for something that costs so little, that seems a bit petty to us. That's why we should suspend standing orders. Legacy Australia, who couldn't shake the Tony Abbott before the election, Legacy Australia said Legacy would be disappointed if any of the welfare payments are cut to the families of deceased or incapacitated veterans. Dave Spillman, president of the Quinana branch of the RSL. We're shocked that our Prime Minister would cut something that helps the kids of RSL members. That is why standing orders should be suspended. The member is the MFC, the uh, Leader of the House. Madam Speaker, the Leader of the Opposition is making no attempt whatsoever to explain why standing orders should be suspended. Instead, he is debating the substance of the motion that he wants to debate if standing orders are suspended. So he's putting the cart say, before the horse. I would say to the Leader of the House that it has become uh, a tradition in this place that a wider interpretation is given on suspension motions, but there is still a requirement on that person moving that motion to refer to the suspension and the reason for the need for the suspension, and I would ask the Leader of the Opposition to do so. Thank you, Madam Speaker. So this decision to suspend uh, standing orders is important because we believe fundamentally that the veterans' orphans should not be political targets by this government. I get that the government has different priorities to many Australians. I get that. But when this government can dream up a scheme which for $260,000 for 1,200 veterans' orphans can dream up of that, this is a government who knows the price of everything and the value of nothing. But indeed, the reason why we should suspend standing orders is because this proposition on veterans' orphans that the government is carrying out is a sign of a bigger malaise in this government. This is a soulless government who will undermine everything that we hold dear in this country. That's why we should be suspending standing orders. They've never seen a group of the vulnerable that they're not interested in kicking. They'll pick on the unemployed, they'll pick on the disability pensioners. They'll undermine Medicare, they'll attack the minimum wage. This is why standing orders should be suspended. They're not interested in equal pay for women. They're not interested in supporting a more positive relationship with the, our near neighbours. This is a government who deserves to have this motion disallowed, and that's why we should suspend standing orders. We all know, we all know that they've got 900 pages of cuts which they won't reveal to us. 900 pages of the same DNA which will see the government attack veterans' orphans. That is why standing orders should be sus suspended. The real problem with this issue 
is that we have a government who is not interested in standing up for all Australians. They're only interested in standing up for some Australians. They say on this issue of the veterans, orphans, that they say that veterans' children will be receiving payments anyway and they won't notice this $211 gone. The only people who can say that are people who've never tried to make ends meet on the existing pensions and entitlements and believe that $211 is nothing at all. They're wrong. It is something. And I believe that Australia's veterans, when they serve us overseas, should have the peace of mind that when they come home, or indeed come home and severely injured, totally and permanently disabled, or indeed if they make the supreme sacrifice, they need to be sure that they have a government and a parliament who has their back. Yeah. There is no test in this country which this government can pass about priorities when it says that we've got your back, but by the way, we're going to chop your orphans, your children who you love very much, by $211. Yeah. This is not adequate policy from this government. That's why we should be suspending standing orders. And I make this point. If orphans, if the families of orphans, if children whose parents have made significant and indeed supreme sacrifices for this country, then it is reasonable. If these orphans cannot trust a government, how can the rest of us? The problem with this government and why we should suspend standing orders is that they have the wrong priorities. They want to whittle this country down. They want to divide this country. They want to attack the vulnerable. And they're too arrogant to admit it when they get it Members, wrong. Time has expired. Is the motion seconded? It is, Madam Speaker. I second the motion. I believe it's important. Uh, I'll give the member the call. Thank you. I'd like the it. Member for Watson. Thank you, Madam call. Speaker. It's important that we suspend standing orders on this issue because it's important that every member opposite is forced to vote personally on whether or not they want orphans of veterans to be able to receive this payment. Yeah. We hear time and again, Madam Speaker, time and again that somehow this was an election commitment when not one of them has been able to produce the brochure they provided to their electorate telling people that somehow this is what they had in store for the orphans of veterans. It's important that we set aside the time in the parliament, Madam Speaker, to force people into the parliament who have currently walked out. The Prime Minister is so proud of his policy on this, he left the chamber the moment the debate commenced. Almost all of the front bench, Madam Speaker, have made sure that they clear out the moment that this debate takes place. But by suspending standing Grant orders Jones, and by making sure that this, vote, this comes to a vote, we make sure that they come back into this chamber in a way that will stand on their record forever, on a way that their electorate will know about and they will not be able to hide from the veterans' communities in each of the electorates that are represented on the other side of that chamber. The priorities here are breathtaking, Madam Speaker, and it's important that we set aside the business of the House to be able to bring this issue to a head. Never once during the campaign is there a quote that anyone has been able to refer to where those opposite said that they were going to cut the entitlements for orphans of veterans, where people had had their parents die defending this nation and they were going to have their benefits cut for an amount of money that equals four high-paid high women receiving paid parental leave under the Prime Minister's gold-plated scheme. You will not find a more breathtaking error in priorities than what the government is doing here. And those opposite must not be allowed to avoid the situation where their name has forever this issue attached to it on the record of this parliament. Hansard records, Madam Speaker, everybody who votes each way and it's recorded forever. And those opposite will never again, after today, be able to claim that somehow they're friends of veterans. Those opposite will never, never and, the, and to hear that member opposite that minister laughing. Well, I'll tell you, there is not one orphan receiving this payment who's laughing. There's not one member of the veterans community who's laughing about this issue. There's not one person who's actually hurt by this issue who sees the humour that the minister opposite sees in this issue. I cannot think of an issue of priorities more outrageous than this. In the scheme of the total budget, we are talking about a payment of around a couple of hundred dollars for each person affected. 
we are talking about a total of 1,200 Australians who are impacted on for this. For the decisions that are made by the Expenditure Review Committee, this is not one that is going to make a significant difference to the bottom line. But if it were to make a significant difference, then the paid parental leave scheme, the gold-plated paid parental leave scheme of the Prime Minister, is there waiting to provide the savings measure, which only four people affected would provide the savings which would allow this measure to continue. Madam Speaker, we see those opposite try to wrap themselves in the flag and claim that they are the patriots of this parliament. Those opposite should be willing to publicise what they are doing on this issue. And no one should pretend that this is somehow wrapped up in the same decision as the mining tax. The fact that there is a disallowance motion on the notice paper right now means that this issue can be dealt with in isolation. And those opposite, when they vote, will have the opportunity to deal with this issue and this issue alone. If they still want to pursue what they want on the mining tax, this debate won't make a difference to that. But it will make an extraordinary difference in the message that this parliament sends to the veterans communities of Australia and will make a very significant difference to the record that hangs around the heads of those opposite for the rest of their parliamentary careers. I call the Honourable the Leader of the House. Thank you, Madam Speaker. <clears throat> Standing orders should not be suspended, and the government's agenda and program for the day should be allowed to continue as was planned for a number of very important reasons. Firstly, because this motion moved by the Leader of the Opposition and seconded by the Manager of, op of Opposition Business is a stunt, a sheer stunt. Secondly, because there was absolutely no preparation for this motion whatsoever in question time. Labor spent the entire question time talking about every other subject until the final question. Now, you would have thought, Madam Speaker, if it was so important that standing orders be suspended, you would have thought this was the subject that would have taken up the entirety of question time from the Labor Party. You would have thought that if they were so outraged and so offended and regarded this as the number one issue that requires the government's agenda to be put on hold for the rest of the afternoon, that they would spend all of question time building for the suspension motion, as we used to in opposition when we thought something was that important. Instead, Labor waited until about 3.04 p.m. this afternoon to ask their first question about this subject. And then, uh, trying to gather the necessary outrage within a matter of about a minute and a half, the Leader of the Opposition launched this extraordinary suspension motion. Now, it is not my responsibility, Madam Speaker, to give the Opposition the uh, advice on how to run tactics from Opposition, but I would give them some advice. I think that their managed Opposition business is not serving them very well. I am talking directly to the suspension of standing orders, Madam Speaker. Leave the House to resume his seat. The manager of opposition business on a well, point of order. I, I respect your ruling earlier, Madam Speaker, about that there is some levity given during suspension of standing Please orders. Talk. Notwithstanding that, the Leader of the House has strayed far and wide and is now oh, no. reverting to issues. The yeah, member character. will resume his seat. There is no point of order. The Leader of the House has the call. I am explaining, which is quite clear to the House. I the of, lead, manager of opposition business to resume his seat. I said there is no point of order, and the Minister has the call. Madam Speaker, there, he cannot simply try and disrupt the debate with constant seat. points of order. It's quite clear to the House and anybody listening, Madam Speaker, although I know we're not broadcasting, that. What I am explaining to the House is the context in which the suspension of standing order should be moved if it was so important that the opposition believed that the government's program should be suspended for the rest of the afternoon. And quite obviously, if the Labor Party thought this was the most important issue of the day, it should have been the subject of question time, building to a suspension of standing orders. And I'm making the point that Labor's tactics have never been good, but on this particular day are spectacularly bad. <laughs> Why should standing orders not be suspended, Madam Speaker? Because there are very important matters that need to be debated this afternoon in the House. I, for one, was looking forward to the speech from the member for McMahon on the government's attempts to wind back investor protection for consumers seeking financial advice, which he regarded apparently as a matter of public importance needing to be debated. But instead, 
the manager of opposition business thinks the member for Command speech is not as interesting as I was looking forward to listening to it, because he wants to suspend standing orders to delay our attempts to get to that matter of public importance. On the programme for the afternoon, Madam Speaker, are bills like the Defence Force Retirement Benefits Legislation Amendment Fair Indexation Bill 2014. And what a spectacular own goal, Madam Speaker, for the Labor Party to move a suspension order a motion today to stop that bill being debated, to delay it further, potentially to delay it too long for it to be properly implemented, which would benefit 57,000 veterans in Australia who stand to gain, who stand to gain the same indexation mechanism as that that exists for the age pension. Now, we think that's very important, and that's why we put it on the agenda to be debated today. But the Labor Party doesn't think so. The Labor Party thinks a stunt, a a stunt such assist. as this is more important than ensuring that 57,000 veterans who've waited, who have waited for years for this measure to be passed, they think that a stunt is more important than debating the DFRDB Fair Indexation Bill 2014. And it speaks volumes. Speaks volumes, Madam Speaker, for the priorities of the opposition that they always elevate politics above good policy. And the 57,000 veterans waiting, waiting to hear that this bill has been passed and gone to the Senate. For every one of those people listening or reading the Hansard in the future, know this: Labor wanted to delay the DFRD bill, the bill, fair indexation bill. In fact, they wanted to stop it from happening today and potentially never happen. So a spectacular own goal. They also want to, Madam Speaker, delay the Social Security Legislation Amendment Green Army Program Bill 2014. Now, the Green Army is a very, very good pub public policy measure by this government, promised before the election, is, look, is being looked forward to in the community and will be a tremendous asset to repairing our environment in a very practical way. It is one of the measures that the government has introduced as a direct action part of our policy for, better, for a better environmental outcomes, for combating climate change, for improving the, the uh, area in which we live, the environment in which we live. But Labor, they think that this stunt that they've moved today is a more important priority, and that's why they want to suspend standing orders to delay the government's program for the rest of the afternoon. I happen to think that we should get on with introducing the DFRDB bill on fair indexation. I think we should get on with debating the Green Army program, because I know many of my colleagues on this side of the House who were proud to promise the Green Army the program before Matt the election Jagger, Jagger. are looking forward to debating it, to allowing their colleagues to have a go as well on that subject, and then to pass that bill and send it to the Senate. But Labor, Labor wants to delay that bill further because they'd prefer to elevate politics over good policy. And finally, the other example I'll give, Madam Speaker, is the Crimes Legislation Amendment Unexplained Wealth and Other Measures Bill 2014 that we also want to debate and pass, because we want to take a hard line with people who gain their wealth through unexplained measures. We want to take a firm line to ensure that law and order is elevated in this country, but not Labor. Labor thinks political stunts should be elevated the political stunts are more important than ensuring that the unexplained wealth and other measures bill is passed through this House and gone. Well, if it's Labor's bill, Member for Jager Jager, why don't you support it and pass it through the House? You've just simply confirmed, confirmed how hopeless your tactics are. Because if you're still supporting that bill, in Member spite of all Jager the ones Jager. you're now rejecting of your own policies in the last parliament, the ones you're rejecting in the Senate, if you genuinely support that bill, why are you continuing to delay it? through these kinds of stunts and pathetic tactics. Now, Madam Speaker, we can't be lectured by the Labor Party on issues to do with veterans. We can't be lectured by the Labor Party on issues to do with veterans or anything to do with their families or their children, because the, the member for um, Fadden has provided me with a very useful, a very useful book, the little book of Labor's defence backflips. And let me just go through them because they highlight they highlight oh, they highlight why this, mo this, this motion should not be carried for a suspension of standing orders. The and the Leader of the Opposition talked entirely about the manager of opposition business. There is no way in the world a member of the opposition would get away with this. I am sorry. The member will resume his seat. The member will resume his seat. I was very, very lenient indeed with both the mover and second of the suspension order. 
and the Leader of the House has been exemplary in the way he's dealt with the motion. Oh, true. In fact, I've tried to show the opposition how to do a suspension of standing orders motion, of which I did many in the last parliament. I'm trying to give you a master class on how to do it, because you need a bit of help. You need a bit of help. But I allow the Leader of the Opposition much latitude in ranging over this subject. And I'd just say to the, the opposition, Member the Rudd Labor Jagger. government said that they would maintain a generous military superannuation well, system in yeah. recognition of the importance of the ADF and the immense responsibility placed on personnel in securing and defending Australia. They then, Labor has never and will never fairly index military superannuation oh, pensions, no, Madam Speaker. I'm showing how the hypocrisy of the Labor Party should the not be rewarded by— The Minister the manager of, the, of opposition time business, time we do a I think, yeah, attempting yeah, to— do exactly the same thing. The manager for opposition business. The Leader of the House is not being relevant to the resolution before us. He has been entirely relevant to the motion. The Leader of the House. Madam Speaker, I'm explaining why, in fact, the suspension should not be carried because of the rank hypocrisy of the Labor Party. For example, they said Federal Labor will continue to focus on maintaining high recruitment and retention levels in the ADF. The only problem is Labor entirely cut the ADF gap year program, which was particularly successful in recruiting women into the ADF. Yep. Labor said that they placed a high demand on people and their families, and so a rogue Labor government will reduce this burden and assist ADF personnel to manage the unique challenges they and their families face in serving the nation. Only problem is, Labor cut trips home for single soldiers to see their families at Christmas. And on and on it goes, Madam Speaker. And that's why standing orders should not be suspended. The question is that the motion be agreed to. All those in favour say aye. aye. The contrary, no. no. I think the noes have it. Division required. Yes. Ring the bells for four minutes.
Lock the doors. The ayes will pass to the right of the chair and the noes to the left of the chair. I appoint the members for Wright and Parks, tellers for the noes, and, the, tell, and uh, the members for Shortland and Lawler, tellers for the ayes. Bob, sit down.
result of the division is ayes 51, noes 83. The question is therefore negative. I call the Leader of the House. Sorry. Madam Speaker, I move that uh, further questions be placed in the notice paper. Thank you. Uh, would members uh, hurriedly take their seats or leave the chamber?